Welcome to Hidden Layers, where we explore the people and technology behind artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Ron Green, and today we have a special episode. Joining me is my co-founder, distinguished engineer, and all-around AI wizard, Zizi Sa. Zizi and I have had the privilege of witnessing the AI revolution in computer vision firsthand. We've seen it grow from a niche academic discipline into a worldwide transformative technology. In this episode, we're going to share our experiences building early systems and what it was like living through the deep learning revolution. And because we're not just about nostalgia, we're also going to give you a peek into the future of AI and what we're most excited about. Zizi earned his PhD in statistics at UCLA, where his research focused on generative hierarchical models for object recognition. He's published widely, including in the International Conference on Computer Vision, Conference on Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition, and the IEEE Transactions on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence. His paper on generative modeling received the Mar Prize Honorable Mention, one of the highest honors in the computer vision community. His professional work includes algorithmic ad targeting at Apple, search ranking at Google, product search and matching at Impossible Ventures, generative modeling at Vicarious AI, and deep learning applications for image understanding and chatbots at HomeAway Expedia. Before UCLA, he earned his BS in computer science at Tsinghua University. Zizi, thanks for being here. I'm really excited. Yeah, thank you so much, Ron. I think it's fun to reach into our memories and super happy to chat about computer vision and our experiences. So you are one of the few people I know um, who's been working in computer vision professionally and academically both before and after the deep learning revolution. Mm. And so, that's, you know, I was true. doing computer vision work back in the 90s and it was just a completely different game back Amazing. then. I got out of the computer vision game a little bit in the 2000s, but you were there. You were there yeah. during the wave of transition from sort of, you know, handcrafted features into deep learning based systems. Yeah. And I thought it would be just a ball to go back and talk about what it was like living through that, uh, arguably one of the most important technological revolutions in human history. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let me tee this up and let's start at the beginning. How did you get interested in computer vision in the first place? Um, so uh, my undergrad was from like 2002 to 2006 and um, I think it's, uh, I was during my last year, uh, during my senior year, I got exposed to computer vision um, by uh, going to uh, the research lab at, at Tsinghua. I think it's called the um, AI lab. Um, and we were doing um, one of the competitions called NIST competition. It's an image retrieval um, task where um, I use like backup words, like backup visual words, and then use a SVM on, on top of that right. to uh, predict uh, which, which images is the most uh, relevant to the query. Uh, so that's the, like, you know, I immediately got super interested into computer vision. Um, so that's kind of my foray into the field. Okay, so I, th I think everybody listening today would be kind of curious. What was it like? So you're building, you know, image recognition, uh, recognition systems yeah. back in the early 2000s. Obviously, no deep learning techniques. What were you doing? What were what was the feature engineering work like? There are a lot of very uh, uh, sophisticated features. Uh, sophisticated features that's that's designed by smart um, scientists and engineers like SIFT, the scale invariant feature transforms, and HOG, uh, I think it's called the histogram of gra gradients. It's very well designed features that will describe a kind of a local region of image. It takes a long time to design. They, they work really well, they're fast. And then, you know, after describing, you know, after extracting key points from the image, you use the like SIFT and HOG like de descriptor to describe those regions. And then you put a classifier on top. And at that time, the popular one was the support vector machines or at a boost. Right. And there's a lot of uh, um, tuning uh, on the hyperparameters of the features as well as the support vector machines. So rather than like, you know, having a very deep understanding of the image, it's really uh, tweaking the parameters and watch if your rank on that competition on, on, the, on the leaderboard will increase or not. It's, it, it's pretty fun. It's a, um, but I feel like, you know, it's very um, parameter tuning heavy. Right. Which is why I, you know, later got into my PhD study 
uh, under my advisor Sun Chen Zhu and Yin Nian Wu um, to uh, try to build a statistical model for uh, understanding images. Right, and you were you were really interested in sort of the the deeper understanding of images, not just sort of necessarily scoring well on some of these metrics, but you were interested in the science and research of how to build computer vision systems that that understood in a deep way. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, during that time, I, I read a paper about image parsing, uh, which is to like really understand image data, like what's in the image. Uh, like if you're, you know, at, as, as a human, how do we understand image? And that paper is about like parsing or decomposing image into um, the low entropy structure, which is kind of like, like line strokes, outlines, those very um, high level structures. And then the high entropy kind of texture, which is the fine details, like the chaotic, the randomness of you know different lighting, different little textures. So that really got into uh, got got me into uh, more statistical uh, modeling approaches of computer vision. And what was that like? What were those techniques? I, I have almost no experience with sort of statistical based computer vision modeling. Yeah. So we're trying to. So in my in my PhD study, uh, I was trying to teach machines to understand image like human. So I think human has a very abstract way of understanding visual signals. Um, it's, it's a very abstract way. So like, you know, when you try to describe an owl, um, well, human can draw an owl with just a few strokes. You, you know, step one, you draw the circle for the head and circle for the body. Um, and step two, you draw the eyes, the foot, uh, and then, of course, the step three is like you know all the <laughs> right. all the fun details, textures. But you know, even step one and step two, uh, the you know the few strokes is enough to to tell that it's owl. Right. So we try to teach the machine to do that, and I worked on the sparse model, um, uh, uh, sparse coding, um, and uh, also Bayesian uh, inference, where we try to. Um, have the model learn from just a few examples, like three or five five images, and try oh, wow. to learn uh, the abstract uh, representation of an object. And at that time, I was working with the data sets. Like you know, when when I collected the data sets, I used the animal heads, and my friends would come around and and say, "Oh, Zizi, are you studying zo <laughs> zoology?" <laughs> But yeah, we're you know trying to uh, learn models to represent natural objects. And were the images you used? Did you do something like uh, uh, contour line detection, and then just mm. take out everything except for the the hard contours to get the outlines for the for the input data? Or what were you doing? Yeah, so we used garbol wavelets. Right. So you know those those filter banks that 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 are like you know local line strokes at different orientations. So we do convolution, we do max pooling, we do another convolution to you know, extract out the parts and then another max pooling. Yeah. You may um feel like these terms are familiar. It's also used in com Comnex. Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of funny. So as a part of this statistical modeling, you were still using kernels, you're still using convolutions, right. you were still doing some of these sort of translation invariant techniques as yeah. a part of that. But that was that was to was that only for the image generation or was or was any of that used in the modeling as well? Mm. So we mainly maximize the likelihood on the image. So it's to generate image, to, to reconstruct image, but not to the fine details like the GANs mm. or the diffusion models now, okay. but rather to reconstruct like hey, very abstract uh, sketches which okay. look like that animal. Um, yeah, and there, there, there's also a lot of uh, latent variables because um, you know the shape will deform. So we use the latent variables to represent the, the, the deformation there. Uh, so there's a lot of EM algorithm, the expectation maximization algorithm, okay. which is very it's it's very uh, beautiful mathematically, but it had a very uh, had a lot of challenge making them work large scale. Like the learning is not very fast. Uh, there's no like stochastic gradient descent type of algorithm to scale it to millions of images. That part is really hard. So right, right. We were able to um, detect like objects like horses, cars. Um, at a pretty good accuracy, kind of you know on par with the state of art at that time. Mm -hmm. But then it kind of plateaued because we cannot scale to millions of images. Right. Yeah. Is this when you is this when you first got interested in sort of generative modeling? 
Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel like you know I really have a have a theme for generative modeling and unsupervised learning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Ram, also curious about your experience. I really wanted to learn about you know what things are like in the in the nineties when you're working with neural nets. Neur- it's a great question. In the nineties, the neural networks we 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 built and, and trained were tiny in comparison now. Mm. I mean, you know. Um, yeah billions or trillions of times smaller. And we were training on machines without GPUs. All we had were CPUs. And, and those CPUs, um, I remember I remember being very excited when we had we got access to a 20 megahertz CPU, you know, <laughs> orders mm-hmm. of magnitude, you know, slower than your, your, your iPhone here. Um, everything back then was handcrafted. Everything was built in C because obviously – Speed was so critical. Yeah. Um, we we couldn't afford to do anything in higher order languages. There were no frameworks. There was nothing. Mm. There was nothing that you really had access to except for just starting with an empty file and, and crafting things from scratch. Mm. And the things I think the things that that is most surprising to people that when I talk to them now that work in AI is that they that because we have these like auto differentiation libraries mm. like PyTorch and TensorFlow and JAX, et cetera, you can create arbitrarily complex sort of processing pipelines and you can put together arbitrary com- arbitrarily complex transformations or mathematical operations and you don't have to worry about how that will be um, – translated into the gradient descent back propagation oper- operation mm. because we have auto differentiation. Yeah. Well, back then, one of the challenges was any changes you made to the pipeline meant you had to literally break out a sheet of paper um, and a pencil and recalculate right. the gradient and the, <laughs> the differential equations from scratch. So what that meant was it was really difficult to experiment mm. broadly because you were, you were kind of confined. Once you, once you committed to certain um, designs, you kind of felt locked in. Mm. And the other thing um, – the other thing, when I look back on the 90s, the number one mistake that I think we made that's just astounding in retrospect is we used sigmoid activations hmm. for everything. We used them for the hidden layers as well, which we now know is really problematic because it leads hmm. to vanishing hmm. and exploding gradients. But back then, all of the work within neural networks was predicated to a greater or lesser extent on some mathematical proofs that had shown that they were universal function approximators. Mm -hmm. And so we felt very confident that we could model anything based upon that paper, but that paper assumed certain architectural constraints, so we didn't want to leave them. We didn't want to try things like ReLU because it wasn't clear if you had something that was only point-wise differentiable if you might throw away that entire edifice on which you'd built. So Mm. it is... It was sort of unimaginably archaic compared to wow. what we do now. Amazing. Uh, and I, I would never want to go back. I feel lucky uh, <laughs> for the deep learning frameworks. So so every time when you change the network architecture, you need to manually on paper derive the gradients That's exactly, in math. That's exactly And then right. implement it back in C, I guess. What, what's what's the tool like? Like um, it, it, so there you know, there was no code generation. No, we did have we did have Al, uh, Wolfram. Um, and mm. if you if you were lucky enough, mm. you you might have a, a copy of that. You could go get yeah. the CD and yeah. run it locally. There, there yeah. was no web access, um, or you had MATLAB or something like that. Mm. But it was still complex because, um, you know, we we can we can do all kinds of weird things now as far as. Um, how the signal f- flows through the models and not even have to be concerned at all about um, how that might affect the the ending function. Because, you know, conceptually, it's just some giant function we're computed, yeah. computing, some giant nested function. Yeah. Well, it's hard to understand how that might disrupt that. And then you could, you could calculate, you know, your derivatives incorrectly and mm. your gradients made no sense. So, all right, so I want to ask you, how did you... How did you react? Um, I wasn't working in computer vision mm. uh, in 2012 yeah. when AlexNet happened, and it just you know set the set the context for anybody who may not be familiar with this. Mm. AlexNet was the first uh, deep learning 
based computer vision model that really um, had a strong impact on the scene because it performed exceptionally well on a competition called ImageNet. Mm. And what's important about this is that prior to this 2012 release, um, most of the um, architectures that were submitted for competition were sort of hand-tuned feature engineered yeah. solutions like you were describing yeah. a moment ago. And AlexNet came in and was this neural network based, you know, quote unquote, deep learning approach, although now we would consider it pretty, pretty shallow in hindsight, even though this was only, you know, 12 years ago. But um, it just blew away the competition. Um, and all of the features, meaning all of the um, all of the signal information that the classifier eventually used to make determinations mm. was calculated automatically yeah. through the training process on the model. So this was a sea change yeah. to best practices at the time. I would love to hear, what did you think? What did your colleagues think? Um, what did your professors think? Um, when you saw the paper, mm -hmm. and I know that you also were good friends with the lead author on the Imine mm -hmm. ImageNet paper. True. So yeah, just yeah. tell me about that whole experience. What was that like and what were you thinking? Yeah, absolutely. That was wild. You know, I graduated um, my PhD in 2021. Uh, uh, sorry, 20, 20, 2011. 2011, right. Um, and uh, when AlexNet came out, I was working at uh, Google. And I was actually in a tech talk. I, I I think it's Alex giving a talk. Um, you know, it's it's you know hosted by Google Brain. You know, Jeff Jeff Dean was the host at that time, and Alex gave a talk about um, using um, comnets for uh, street number detection and segmentation, and the accuracy was over the roof. You know, com compared to the numbers that I was used to before. Right. And I was really amazed. Uh, and another impression was that you know it's it takes so much resource to train. I think um, it was using disbelief at that time. That's the pre precursor for, for uh, be before TensorFlow. Um, yeah, on thousands of machines, I believe. So very resource intensive, but super accurate. And honestly, I mean, deep learning com 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 nets for computer vision it means a lot. It automates the feature design, which was really painful in the twenty. Um, 2010s, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, cause what did you think about that, though? I mean, I've talked to people who were disappointed a little bit. Oh, yeah. Because they were like, that. so much of their academic focus was on the feature engineering part. Like, were you a little yeah. disappointed or were you excited? Oh, absolutely. There's definitely an <laughs> emotional com component to, to that. Um, I mean, we, we, we talk about AI replacing jobs. You know, which jobs were first replaced? <laughs> it's the very job of AI researchers in computer <laughs> vision. Yeah, I mean, since feature design is automated now, um, but I mean, it's definitely for the good. Um, so in a in a 2010s, when we, because one one of the hard, hard problems of uh, vision is the hierarchy, like from objects to the primitives, like the edges, there's a lot of uh, layers that you need to go through. You need to group edges into small parts and to bigger parts, and then to like you know, larger parts and then to objects. There, the, the design space is so large, you, you need to design the features, make sure your code is bug free there. You need to have a learning algorithm for you know, grouping the features into parts. You know, it's it's just so complicated. But with with the deep learning, with the comnets, a lot of that is automated away, right. and you don't have to care about that a lot. And you you would your your design space shifted from mm -hmm. features to uh, network architectures and loss functions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely a a major change. Did you have Did you have any of the people you worked with either either professors? Or other students or colleagues at work that that dismissed it out of hand. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I th I think we probably both have you know um, heard stories like that because deep um, like co common nets, um, RNs, or deep learning were not very popular before uh, 2012. Right. So the dominating met methods then was like you know support vector machines, um, uh, graph. Graphical model, Bayesian graphical models, a lot of you know bleed propagation, you know stuff like that, and things like 
deep learning with so many parameters trained on even millions of images, you know, compared to the parameters, it's still a small data set compared to the number of parameters. So right. such models shouldn't work. Right. Like, you know, if you ask a statistician, this is like, you know, how how could this happen? It's this just over-parameterized. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it shouldn't work, but, you know, in reality, it, it actually works. <laughs> in theory, it shouldn't work. Yeah. But in and, actuality, it does. And a lot of things that feels hacky, like the relu and other, like, you know, pooling, you know, different different um, um, engineering components in it. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily derive from first principles. It's, 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 it's a very smart design. But you know, but they feel like hacks almost. Yeah, they almost feel feel like hacks. So right. you know, kind of like the popular opinion then, uh, before seeing the real success, is that eh, why should it work? Don't 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 spend time on it. Yeah, so. yeah. You know, it's so funny in the, in the nineties, um, that was the same sentiment. Um, it was this sense that. Um, if it did work, it was just kind of luck, but it wasn't really principled. It was it was this sense that that. A bunch of things are being tried, but it's not scientific. It was more, almost more like experimental, s experimental scattershot engineering instead, right? Yeah. Um, and I agree with you. I think things like, you know, Relu, first time I saw that, I thought it was crazy. I mean, I just thought that was nuts. <laughs> right. A dropout makes no mm -hmm. sense. You know, theoretically, I, I, you know, this idea of just turning off neurons mm. randomly it just feels sort of so unprincipled, but the, you know, that those are two um, tiny, in the grand scheme of things, tiny algorithmic changes that have massive improvements mm. uh, or generated massive improvements. So it's just really amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I want to ask you: What did you think about ImageNet? Oh, that's a uh, you know one of the most influential work in computer vision, and and it's funny. Um, I mean, um, so the first, the first author, Jia Jia Dan, um, is my college roommate. Um, he, he was actually not doing computer vision at that time. He was in Princeton, um, uh, with Kai Kai Li doing, I believe, uh, distributed sy systems. And then he moved to Stanford to work with Fei Fei. Uh, I think we were actually, you know, doing the road trip together at that time. Um, and, uh, so in, the first time I learned of uh, his work in ImageNet was in CVPR09 um, in, Mi in Miami, I believe. And, uh, um, you know, Andrew Kapati is also one of the co-authors. Co co um, so at that time, I just feel like, okay, it's a great work. You know, it's a much larger data set than Caltech or CIFAR100 because it's millions of images, tens of thousands of categories. It's a great data set, but it's still a classification data set. What does a larger data set buy you? It doesn't really solve the vision problem. It, it will help, but you know, probably not the most important and one. And that's because you you were focused on deeper understanding, right? You wanted you you thought the data set was fine, but you were you were kind of going in the direction of more a deeper understanding of, of visual understanding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At that time, I feel like you know, algorithm has to be the the first uh, consideration. But it turns out, you know. The scaling law holds right? <laughs> data, compute, lots of experimentation with deep learning, of course, and then you know you get to well, uh, much much higher accuracy. It's a, such an influential paper. I mean, ImageNet, and that triggers a tsunami of, of innovation on the algorithm side. Yeah, it really did. I think with, you know, without ImageNet, we don't have AlexNet. Without AlexNet, you know, I don't know how much longer it takes till we we see this resurgence uh, in right. neural networks and deep learning. Yeah, exactly. And after that, you know, transfer learning is a thing now. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, yeah. we we have been talking about representation learning for a long time. There's the top down, like kind of designed representation. There's the learned representation. But you know, after ImageNet, you'd start to see you know VGG Nets open source trend down. You know ImageNet, right? And uh, when you apply those models to applications like you know object detection, like you know, um, various computer vision tasks, you usually uh, pre-trend from a ImageNet weights, for example. That's right, and that. Uh, did increase the accuracy a lot. On the um, on the um, breast cancer project, um, mm. I I seem to recall. Did we even start with ImageNet weights on that? 
Yes. So yeah, that's that's one of the hyperparameters. So we either start from random weights or start start from ImageNet. It it didn't make sense to me in the beginning because ImageNet is a natural images data set. It's not like uh, mem uh, mammograms, breast imaging. Right. It doesn't look like that. But still, uh, if you initialize your weights from the ImageNet weights, uh, we see uh, gain in accuracy. That's, that's right. And, and and I and I think. Um I think the reason is, is is what you hinted at a moment ago. It's because when you train a model on that much natural data, mm. um, it is you you force it to learn certain type of feature um, extraction mm. capabilities, whether yeah. it's you know contour detection or or reoccurring Corner. patterns, corners, and things like that. Yeah. And that's just helpful and useful no matter what you're doing, yeah. wh whatever downstream visual task. And yeah, so exactly. that, that kind of powered and enabled the transfer learning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to change focus and talk about the shift in computer vision over the last few years. So we have the early 2000s up into the sort of, you know, early 2010s where we have hard feature engineering based work with some type of classifier like a mm. support vector machine or something like that we see the the deep learning revolution take hold all of all of the um, most uh, popular models within computer vision at that time mm. are some type of variant of a convolutional neural right. network right yeah. which interestingly goes all the way back to the 80s but if finally we finally had enough data we finally had enough compute um, and we you know ironed out some algorithmic issues like we've already talked about relu and dropout mm. so we get these convolutional models and um, we're seeing really amazing results and then mm. transformers yeah Talk and that was in that. 2017, right? The yeah. attention paper. Yeah, the attention paper 2017. You don't really see transformer-based computer vision models for a few years after that. Right. Talk about that. Yeah. Your thoughts on that. Yeah. Oh, I just realized I misspoke earlier when I say 2010s. What I meant is the, the two, 2000s, like the before the deep, deep learning. Right. In, in, in 2010s, I think we, we saw a lot of great convolutional nets based models for detection, like, uh, you know, well, I mean, VGG rest net as, as backbone. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, for object detection, we have retina net, for example, uh, th that we use for document understanding. Um, but still, um, you know, in computer vision, um, people use one type of neural nets, but for natural language processing, you typically use LSTM or other recursive structures. Um, Transformers is, is 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 what I feel kind of un unite the two and makes the design even simpler. So we we see more convergence there. Right. Um, so with the transformers, I think you know because um, pre pre previously when we do document understanding, we would train the retina net and we will tinker with the anchor boxes so that it will um will, will literally just go into the source code and, and 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 change the anchor box design there to uh to deal with the very small tiny binding boxes in documents that's high 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 resolution um but for when when transformers is out, out you know we then transition into models like lay llm which combine both vision and NLP features, both text and visual features, right. that you know really increase the accuracy a lot. Yeah, what Ron? What do you see about you know um, transformers that uh, you know kind of change how we how we work? Uh, the transformers are um, unbelievably important, obviously, and I think that um, a couple things. One is I remember I remember vividly in 2018, 2019, um, feeling like we have transfer learning and computer vision, which is wonderful. And it was really um, a game changer because it meant you weren't starting every project from scratch. Right. NLP, you're doing natural language processing. You started every project from scratch. There wasn't really anything except for maybe like, you know, word to vac weights or something right. like that. Yeah. That was really all you had. When transformers hit um, all of a sudden you saw so much of the upstream feature engineering or pre-processing pre -processing that you would do in NLP just fall away like we saw in computer vision. And then you had the ability to have a single architectural approach that you could leverage for both computer vision 
and natural languaging processing projects. And amazingly, that meant then we could do multimodal. Like you said, then we could combine these yeah. modalities and yeah. have a single model that was capable of understanding them both for the first time ever. That just wasn't impossible before. And another fallout of that that's really important is that meant all of a sudden, you know, NLP researchers mm -hmm. and computer vision researchers who could barely talk to each other in, let's say, 2005 yeah. could collaborate and communicate and build systems together because the lingo mm -hmm. and the nomenclature and the, yeah. and the tools and the techniques had consolidated within transformers. And so I think transformers are... Uh, this is not, you know, this is not some great insight, but they're probably the most important architectural yeah. um, innovation within AI of the 21st century so far. Um, but I want to throw it back to you, diffusion, right? So diffusion, yeah. diffusion as a technique, a yeah. incredibly important. And we're seeing diffusion techniques. Um, they probably, they probably first came on the scene for text to image generation like uh dolly and things like that mm -hmm. now we're seeing it for everything we're seeing it for music generation mm -hmm. um video generation um we're seeing it within within a uh, healthcare um we just had a hackathon last weekend uh in the biomedical space yeah. right and it was all about using diffusion techniques for protein yeah. uh generation. Right. So what are your thoughts? You're, so you know much more about generative models than me. I know it's a, a, a passionate area for you. What are your thoughts on diffusion? Diffusion was a big surprise to me. It works surprisingly well. So before diffusion, people are like, you know, doing the likelihood modeling directly, trying to estimate the den density directly. But, you know, uh, diffusion is closely related to score matching. You're not directly matching where the data points are. You're matching the arrows. They are, you're trying to match the gradient the direction of you know, point to, pointing to the most dense areas. And that worked really well. Um, diffusion models are not are, are not tied to any specific backbones. It's not tied to ComNets or transformers, but it works really well with transformers uh, in like the very most most recent works like the DIT, the model that's behind the Sora, you know, uh, from OpenAI. Mm -hmm. And it's also, you know, with with transformers, as long as your data can be tokenized and detokenized, yeah, and you know it can be encoded and decoded, you can put it, you, you can shove it into the transformer, and you you know you use the diffusion um, training loop. It's 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 really a training loop where you start from clean data and you you corrupt it and you train the model to find a way back. Right. So you know your yeah, it's 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 crazy to think about now. You have a neural network that predicts the gradients of a log likelihood right but that 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 works really well and you know the um after uh i think it's fairly recent like the diffusion models is is, is in the 2020s i but, believe i believe so yeah yeah but it's it, even the diffusion models are starting to be uh, a little stale now <laughs> people are uh, like switching to flow matching uh, right. well you kind of can argue maybe maybe that's you know kind of a special case or a generalization of a diffusion model so you're still trying to uh, train the model to, f to find a way back. But the way to do that is more, uh, more flexible now. You can design the flow to, f to, to get back to the clean data. Right. Okay. So you jumped, I, I, that was the last thing I wanted to cover and you teed it up perfectly, which is I think flow modeling and mm. fusion models and these techniques are some of the things I'm most excited about. Mm. Because like you said, you can take a process where it may look just utterly impossible to go from mm. sort of point A to point Z, mm. but you break it down into steps right. and train a model to take these little steps one by one. Yeah. And then you all, it almost seems like magic is the result, right? Mm. Um, and I, I use, uh, I think protein folding might be one of the most mm. um, important examples because this was um, hands down one of the most important unsolved problems within biology. And, you know, we've talked to a lot of biologists recently, and it's just considered to be a solved problem at this point. So what are your thoughts? We're like, uh, we'll wrap up like this. I'm dying to know, what are you most excited about within AI and computer vision, whether it's some unsolved problem, some new techniques, or just an area where you think we're making progress and, and you are excited to, to be involved and see where we can take it? 
Oh, there the such a great question, and I think there are probably more more than one. So um, there's the multi-modal trend of the, you know now we start from language model R LLMs to vision language models, and then more recently there's the um, I think people call it uni uni model. So like you know any to any. So there's a recent work called Transfusion that kind of you know even combine um, transformers. Um, uh, well, I mean like the auto auto regressive generation with the uh, diffusion type of generation in parallel. So that is right. able to like you know hey your inputs can be text text image video audio music and your output is text text video you know robotic action. You just switch on and off and you you know. Because you know mo most of the bu business data have uh, multiple modalities. You have transactions, text, images. So such a model, you only need one big model to learn um, kind of all of your business, which is really exciting. Another direction is robotics and embedded uh, vision systems, which is you know we we see you know Figure and you know Boston Dynamics. You know a lot of the computer vision models are now um, um, applied. To systems like that, to 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 make the robotics more intelligent, able to navigate and help us in our lives. I'm also super yeah, excited the, about that. Yeah, diffusion I think has has uh, unlocked robotics in a way that nobody really fully expected, and we're seeing we're seeing giant steps in robotics. I think because of that process. Right. Yeah. Any any other further thoughts? Anything you're really excited about in the future? You want to wrap up and discuss? We didn't talk about nerve yet. That's a that's another really interesting topic. Like right. The neural radiance fields, the three D reconstruction and Gaussian splats. But you know that that probably takes <laughs> takes a long time to dive into. But that's another kind of very surprising and very exciting development over the last few All right, years. I'll tell you what, we'll do another episode soon. We'll come on and we'll we'll dig into that. Sounds good. ZZ, it's so thank fun. you so much. This was just a ball and I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Ron. Glad to be here. Thank you for listening to Hidden Layers. This series is hosted by Kung Fu AI, a management consulting and engineering firm focused exclusively on artificial intelligence. If you have any questions or thoughts about today's episode, or if you know someone we should feature, please visit us at kungfu.ai.